Question 116, we've got an 18 year old girl who presents with persistent loose offensive stools and failure to gain weight on, abdo- on examination, her abdomen is distended. She has a skin rash affecting her elbows and knees and blood count reveals iron deficiency anemia. Which of the following single most appropriate investigations do we need to order? So what do we suspect so that this really young child that's got loose stools, failure to gain weight, distended abdomen and rash has with an iron deficiency anemia. We suspect she has celiac disease. So we're going to go for IgA, tissue transglutamase. Um, and uh, NICE says that our first go-to test would be when we suspect celiac disease is the tissue transglutamase. Next step is IgA endomycial antibodies. Um, If they are negative, but we're still clinically suspicious, then we check for an IgA deficiency. If we have an IgA deficiency, then we do serological tests now instead of testing for the antibodies for uh, the tissue transglutamase and the endomycial antibodies. Next step after that is to refer her to a gastrointestinal specialist who will usually transfer her for an intestinal biopsy. If all the tests are negative, uh, but we're still clinically suspicious, then it's better to still refer to a gastroenterologist um, for further assessment. Question 117, we've got a newly born neonate presents with microcephaly, chorioretinitis, thrombocytopenia and hepatosplenomegaly. CT shows intraspheral periventricular calcifications, which of the following is the single most likely diagnosis. So this was nearly toxoplasmosis, but not quite there yet because our triad would usually be the microcephaly, the chorioretinitis and the hydrocephalus. It is incredibly rare. The answer here instead is our cytomegalovirus, which is the commonest infection um, that we get as a congenital infection, which usually spreads transplacentally, but can also be transmitted perinatally by aspiration of the cytovaginal secretions in the birth canal or via breastfeeding. Um, so most of the children um, infected are healthily, healthy, but later on re- um, develop the sequelae. And most commonly, we hear of sensory neural hearing loss. Um, there are an unlucky 10% which develop something called cytomegalic inclusion disease. And that's characterized by IUGR, hepatosplenomegaly, hematological abnormalities, um, and you get various cutaneous manifestations such as petechiae and purpura, also known as blueberry, buff, blueberry muffin baby. Um, you've got lots and lots of manifestations in the CNS, as in this question. You get microcephaly, you get the ventricular megaly, cerebral atrophy, chorioretinitis. You can get calcifications, which are typically periventricular in CMV. Um, and obviously later in life, they're going to have cognitive um, defo- um, inabilities or mishaps. Um, and then most of the children, even if they do survive the cytomegalic inclusion disease, they're obviously going to have lots of long term neurological sequelae. Um, and it is actually estimated that CMV is the second most common cause of mental retardation in children. Treatment is with an antiviral called gangocyclovir. Question 118, we've got a two-year-old male who presents with a long history of constipation. He's also always complains of progressive abdominal distension and not being open, able to open bowels. So we've got a young male, constipation, abdominal distension is going to be Hirschsprung's disease. And Hirschsprung's disease results from the absence of enteric neurons within the myenteric and submucosal plexus of the rectum or the colon. It's commoner in males, usually appears in the first two years of life. Half of the children diagnosed with this um, disease are less than a year old, and a small number of children are, are diagnosed later in life. Um, the main sort of symptom is chronic constipation. A new mother comes to visit you with her 10-year-old son at least once every day. Her son vomits up his entire feed. The vomiting is not projectile, so that rules out pyloric stenosis, but the rather feed returns to mouth and spills over his top. He's well in himself, really important point, and he's got normal weight for age. Which of the most 
um, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So he's well, so it doesn't seem that it will be a gastroenteritis. The vomiting isn't projectile and he's got a normal weight. So that makes the only sort of viable answer physiological positing, which is effortless regurgitation of food. It's a very normal phenomena in most newborn children. And most children will be going on to do this up until the age of 12 months. Question 120, we've got a six-year-old boy who's got a one-month history of achy bones and muscle pains. Um, his examination findings are pale, multiple bruises um, on his legs extent and extensive lymphadenopathy. We've got last cells on our blood film. What is the most likely diagnosis? So we've got young child, blast cells on blood films. And we've got aching bones and muscle pains and lymphadenopathy. What could it be other than acute lymphoblastic leukemia, especially with blast cells being seen on the blood film? So it's the most common leukemia in children. Um, what happens is the blast cells usually infiltrate the bone marrow and the lymphoid tissue. When they infiltrate the bone marrow, they cause um, pancytopenia. Um, so you get the anemia, thrombocytopenia, the, the sort of bruising and the particular rashes. Um, and you get predisposed to infections. It's also known to affect the central nervous system. So they usually get headache, vomiting, meningism, um, cranial nerve palsies and seizures. Um, so what, when you usually do a blood film, they usually have a white, high white cell count. And when we do a bone marrow aspiration, we usually see more than 20% blast cells. That's pathognomonic. Um, if we were to do an LP, that would be to detect cerebral involvement. So therapy is usually symptomatic treatment, such as transfusions and antibiotics if they have an infection. Mainstay is usually chemotherapy, which is given in three main stages, remission, induction, consolidation and maintenance. Um, and that can be for a number of years. Um, since they are at very high risk of neuro developing neurological disease, then we give CNS prophylaxis, which is in the form of intrathecal methotrexate and radiotherapy. About 95% of children, oh, sorry about that, um, are expected to achieve remission. Question 121, we've got a 24-year-old male equatorian competition is thrown off his horse. Following the incident, he complains of paralysis in his left leg, but after much investigation, no cause can be found. He can't ride horses anymore. What is the most likely diagnosis? So is it conversion disorder? No, what is conversion disorder? Uh, sorry, that's the answer. <laughs> I do apologize. So conversion disorder is sort of when you internalize a problem and you convert it into a physical symptom. Uh, we wouldn't go for somatization because somatization is when somebody who's usually before the age of 30 has lots and lots of symptoms and um, doesn't really have any pathology. We wouldn't go for hypochondriasis because a hypochondriac is somebody who misinterprets um, some bodily symptoms um, and always goes for the worst thing. Whereas dissociation is someone who completely dissociates from themselves, develops depersonalization um, and uh, or identity disorders. Whereas malingering is where somebody is faking having some kind of illness and there is usually um, some kind of financial gain behind that. It's well known in prisoners and military personnel, whereas Massachusetts is um, usually in young adult males who think they have uh, physical or psychological disorders and they're usually faking it. Uh, it's different from malingering in that there usually is in financial gain. Question 122 is we've got a 30 year old female who presents with reduced visual acuity and color perception in her left eye, which is preceded by orbital pain. On examination, she has a pupillary light defect um, in the left eye and fundal examination shows a swollen optic disc. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So We've got a very characteristic feature here, which is loss of color perception and orbital pain. It's going to be an optic neuritis, right? So optic neuritis is usually associated with a multiple sclerosis. However, it can occur in isolation, twice as common as in females. They are usually aged 20 to 45. There's usually a history of preceding viral illness, 
like we said, they usually have deteriorating vision, dyschromatotopsia, and they have the eye pain as well. Um, usually, um, when we do an eye examination, we see what's known as a relative afferent pupillary defect or a marker scan pupil. Um, on fundoscopy, they usually have a papillitis or the optic nerve can become really pale. Um, treatment is usually with the steroids and an MRI or an evoked potential can demonstrate the presence of an inflamed optic nerve. We can also diagnose it, diagnose it by diagnosing multiple sclerosis through an LP, and that's by seeing the oligoclonal glands or an elevated IgG index. Question 123, we've got a 30-year-old male is recovering from a musculocutaneous nerve injury, and assessment of his biceps shows that he can now actively flex his elbow against active gravity, sorry, which of the following muscle grade power would you give him? And that would be a grade three. That's because he can move it against gravity. So our MRC scale for muscle power is grade zero, no muscle contraction, one flickering contraction, two, some active movement, three, being able to move it against gravity as in this case, four is when you can move it against resistance, five is normal power. Question 124, uh, we've got a 30 year old female who you saw a few months ago with mild moderate depression has returned for a follow up appointment. She's not found the CBT you organized useful. Which of the following is the next appropriate step in management? Next step would be let's start the medication, SSRI, fluoxetin. Usually when you have someone with mild to moderate disease, you don't want to rush into starting medication. You start off with a two week period of watching and waiting, encouraging sort of um, healthy lifestyle, encouraging exercise, CBT, which can be self-help based or computerized relaxation therapy. If that doesn't work or um, you have special instances where the depression is associated with psychosocial medical problems or if they've got um, depression which is complicating physical health problems or they've had a previous history of moderate or severe depression or they've had depressive symptoms for more than two years then you might um, start thinking about considering um, starting medication when you've got someone who's got moderate to severe expression then you go with high intensity physiological treatment um, in addition to starting medications which are usually ssris citalopram for fluoxetin sertraline um, you might uh, refer them for um, an urgent psychiatric referral if they are dangerous, danger being that they've got suicidal ideas, plans, they're going to harm themselves or someone else, or if they're psychotic. ECT can also be considered in really severe cases. Question 125, we've got a 75-year-old female with a history of hypertension and previous TIAs who's becoming increasingly vague and neglectful um, she's now become aggressive. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So here we've got a stepwise fashion of change and we've got sort of personality changes. So we're going to go for multi-infarct or vascular dementia. It uh, comprises about 25% of all dementias. And the key word here is being stepwise as it is a cumulative result of all the previous small strokes. Question 126, we've got a 20 year old female who presents with sudden severe occipital headache, which she likens to a kick at the back of the head. She's also felt nauseous um, and vomited, which of the following diagnosis is most likely. This is very, very concerning because she's had a bad occipital headache, which has caused her to vomit. So we're gonna think immediately that she's had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it's really common in people that smoke and people that are hypertensive. It usually happens in 35 to 65 years. 
Um, one of the telltale signs, apart from the sudden occipital headache, can be neck stiffness. Well, Koenig sign may be present. So uh, what we usually do is we perform a CT head. If we do see um, the a usual bleeding pattern of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then we go for angiography to immediately plan out what sort of management this patient's going to have surgically. Um, if they do need that at all. Um, if we don't see anything on the CT, then we need to consider doing a lumbar puncture. Usually a lumbar puncture within six to 12 minutes is proper blood stain. If we wait any longer and it's within 12 hours to two weeks, then we see the danthochromia. Um, so initial management is to prevent the further bleeding and reduce the rate of the complications, which are usually hydrocephalus or cerebral ischemia. So question 127, we've got a 19 year old female with learning difficulties and a previous history of epilepsy is brought into A&E by paramedics. She's been fitting for the last hour and a half and she's still fitting. What's the most likely diagnosis? So elderly, well, she's not very young, she, she's 19. She's been fitting for more than an hour and a half. That's really, really worrying. So this is status epilepticus. Um, so it's defined as generalized convulsions, which last 30 minutes or longer, or it's repeated tonic clonic convulsions over 30 minutes without recovery of consciousness. So main management is, first of all, we start with our benzodiazepines, which can be lorazepam, diazepam, or even buccalmidazolam. If they don't work, uh, sorry, uh, um, next step is we go on to giving our Big guns such as phenytoin, phenobarbitone, if those don't work, then we go for anesthesia, which would usually be propofol, thiopentin or midazolam, and, uh, which is 12 to 24 hours after the seizure being detected clinically or EEG. Question 128, we've got a 77-year-old female who has gradually lost the ability to recall recent events, although she is able to recall events from her childhood, from the war, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Um, so here we've got somebody who can't remember things that are immediately happening, so that's going to be Alzheimer's disease. So... Uh, what are the key symptoms that they come with when they have Alzheimer's? Aphasia is they can't talk, apraxia, they can't write or draw anymore, and agnosia, they have issues recognizing faces and names of things. They have other issues such as general cognitive symptoms, which include impaired judgment, decision making and orientation. They can also have hallucinations, delusions. Um, we would diagnose it by doing a mini mental state examination and a score of 20 through three or less would generally be considered diagnostic of dementia. Um, it needs a holistic approach to be managed um, and that would be um, sort of can be augmented by the use of medications such as donazepil, galantamine, rivastigmine and mimantin. Prognosis is usually quite bad and we expect life um, to go on for another five to 20 years. The most common cause of death is infection. Question 129, we've got a 15 year old girl who is quiet and withdrawn, comes to see you with her mother. She has a four month history of weight loss and secondary amenorrhea. The body max index is less than or is 16. Clinical examination is unremarkable. All blood tests are normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? So we've got young girl, quite withdrawn, weight loss, secondary amenorrhea, and a very, very low BMI. So it's going to be anorexia nervosa. So uh, anorexia nervosa is, has a scale of being mild to extreme, and any BMI which is 17 or above is considered anorexia. Um, most importantly, we need to make sure that we've done an ECG to make sure that they don't have any signs of heart strain and a bone scan um, if it's gone out for more or if the anorexia has been going on for one year to rule out osteoporosis. Which of the following is the most appropriate screening tool for anxiety and depression? And that's going to be the hospital anxiety and depression screening tool. It consists of 14 questions. If you have 10 or more, that's considered significant. <laughs> 